Right, so what have we got now? The, um, the order from December. Oh, yes. Uh, sec second page, paragraph three, is uh, what I think. Can we just have a copy of these, uh, this, this order, Usher, please? Thank you very much. Paragraph three. Second page, paragraph three, I think, is the uh, the order, the consent for the discharge from the hospital to the care home. I'm checking to see if we've got a sealed copy. I'm not sure that we do. Right. Right. Thank you. Yes. Let's go. <clears throat>
that pendant legal wrong, though none has occurred at present. And he says, and the relevant uh, quote is at, at page 88 in the Rundle. Explain what you understand, what you submit is to be understood by the phrase unconscionable behaviour. Well, I mean, it's, it's a bit of an answer, Sally, my lord. Uh, in my submission, it's got no relevance to, to this case because unconscionable behaviour uh, in the South Carolina case, of course, it's, it's a reinsurance case and it's thinking about attempts to thwart the actions of the court. Uh, in the Banji case, to which the official solicitor refers, uh, and that's in the bundle at 13. Uh, Ismail Abdullah Bamji and David Corsick. Uh, it's a case about. That's not 13. 13 is South yes. Carolina. Uh, forgive me, it's 25. I'm so sorry. I'm having difficulty <coughs> moving between glasses and areas in which I can actually see. No, no, I understand that. Um, uh, in, in, and in that case, it's, it's a, an injunction case brought against an individual who's brought loads of um, vexatious claims against barristers, silks, and ministers. In both of these cases, in my submission, the meaning of unconscionable behaviour is, is with reference to attempts to thwart the administration of the court. And notwithstanding, I, I understand that, that both of the respondents' cases would be that that, that is the appellant's intention in this submission. A, I would say it absolutely isn't. But B, in terms of the evidence, the behaviour that's at issue in the injunction case is about behaviour within, purported behaviour, alleged behaviour within the confines of hospital. It's not in my submission the, the form of relevant behaviour that comes within the meaning of unconscionable behaviour. And in those circumstances, it's not relevant to the grant of an injunction. Right. I'm going to move on then to uh, the application to uh, my client's case. And forgive me, I, I don't like calling her my client, but I'm, I'm, I'm worried that I'm going to otherwise call her. No, that's I, mean, right. I, I shouldn't. Um, I'm very mindful, my lords, that this is an appellate court um, and that ordinarily I would restrict myself to submissions on matters of the law. But having addressed you at some length on the law, I'm following the submissions of my learned friends on the law and, and bearing in mind the uh, 52 one I think it is, uh, power of the court to uh, make the order itself. My submission would be, notwithstanding that 
my take ultimately is that no, no injustice should have been made at all in any event. It should not be made against my client. Um, not least, and this is just going back, I have said I've moved on from, from the law, but I just wanted to make one final point, which is obviously my case is that it should be the just and, and convenient test, not the necessary or expedient test. I did ask my clerk, and it's may have come because I should have thought to do this before, but I did ask my clerk to come up with the definite dictionary definition of expedient. And for reasons best known to themselves, they, they've gone for the Cambridge, rather than Oxford, uh, dictionary definition. But that is helpful or useful in a particular situation, but sometimes not morally acceptable. Now, I, I, I'm fully aware that that's not a properly defined uh, term, and I will provide it in my response tomorrow. But in my submission, the definition of expedient is so, is so broad in its reach in terms of what it would empower the court to do, that if that alone is the test, uh, in my submission, it would be hugely problematic, not least on the basis of a pure uh, natural justice, to say that the court protection can grant an injunction in any circumstances where it is expedient, so to speak. Because, of course, that's section 16.5, it is an either or provision. It's not necessarily and expedient, it's necessarily or expedient, and it could be expedient to do almost anything, moral or not, reasonable or not, in the course of an order. Well, that's the word Parliament has chosen. <clears throat> Quite so. But it's one thing, my Lord, to say that that's the word, word that Parliament has chosen in terms of ancillary orders. It's quite another to say, notwithstanding that there is a statutory provision laid down by Parliament under the Senior Courts Act, which defines the terms in which an injunction should be granted. However, that fact notwithstanding, this statutory court has powers that are expedient that en enables it to grant an injunction. I see that expedient is any wider than convenient. Just and convenient, then, my lord. Isn't well, it? I suspect from the convenient part. You can say the convenience might be said to be very wide and not necessarily importing any moral you know, <coughs> boundaries. It might be slightly to be that it's convenient to you. Um, so really that the your distinction really comes from the word just. Right? Which wouldn't be reflected if you if you if you follow the section sixteen five reach alone. Because you could but just have it. The difficulty I have with that is that surely the Court is always um, required to act justly. Under its overriding objective? Well, generally. Well, even. even <laughs> yeah. before, the courts were acting justly before we had overriding objectives. Quite so, quite so. And under the Human Rights Act. And, and, and I understand that, and, and recognise that, my Lord. Uh, but in my submission, just and convenient is, is, is such an important statutory phrase. Other statutes that replicate the injunctive powers. And I'm not going to go over this because I think my learned friend will address you on it more, such as the Sexual Harassment Act, have their own statutory terms of how they say an injunction should be granted. And in my submission, it would be peculiar, if not startling, for our work from this, this situation, to find that in this case, there's no direct reference to an injunction under the court protection. However, under Section 65, you can import a much lower text than anywhere else, notwithstanding that we all understand that cap courts act just. to the application of the test to my client. Um, the evidence, uh, the basis on which the trust argues its case and its grounds is to say that even if the judge failed to apply the appropriate test for making an injunction, which includes the requirement that it be just and convenient, the court should uphold the injunction on the basis that on the factual findings made by the judge, it was both just and convenient and is necessary to preserve the placement of the care home. Well, your case is the order should not have been made against your client, whatever test. Yes, absolutely. Um, and and I, I don't know if it's of assistance to the court for me to take you very briefly through the evidential basis on which the orders were made. I will be brief. Well, you must make your submissions on behalf of your client as you think fit. Um, the, the, the high point of the evidence was brought uh, in terms of the, the necessity for the injunction was in the witness evidence of the deputy chief executive. Uh, I'm just thinking I sh probably shouldn't name him. No. 
So his witness statement, so that you can see who he is, is in the supplementary bundle at tab 13. Where do we find where do you, where is the evidence against your client? Well, there isn't any. So he he refers uh, a paragraph really to a potential problem in facilitating the, the discharge. Uh, in paragraph three again about doubt on the move, hesitancy by the care home in paragraph five, and and fears at paragraph ten for the um, corporate. Reputation. Is your client mentioned in this document at all? No. Uh, in fact, in the evidence, I'm just, I'm just checking the way, yes, so there's no direct evidence reference to her whatsoever in that. There's evidence brought by the next person at 14, who is uh, a nurse employed by the CCG as was. She's the chief nurse and head of quality. She mentions LF, I think it's 14 times, and there's no mention of my client. There's evidence from Sarah Perez, who mentions the father on numerous occasions, and makes no direct reference to my client. Okay, well, I'm going at the judgment. In paragraph 47, where is the evidence in support of paragraph? Is that is, is the last sentence, penultimate sentence of paragraph 47 of the judgment? Let's start with that. Was that admitted by your client in August 2020? So, to give some context to that, my lord, uh, that was an incident that arose in the context of one of the nurses' evidence. Uh, it wasn't admitted. There was a disputed evidence by my client okay. as to the basis on which it arose. All right. But so, it, is where is is there written evidence about that? No. Um, somebody will jump in and correct me if I'm wrong on that. My point on that, my lord, is that is the high point of the evidence, which led his lordship to say that my client would would, would act to facilitate her her husband, says you. And I can see the point you're you're looking at. August 2020, she navigated her partner back onto the ward, knowing that he'd been excluded for failing to comply with COVID regulations and premises from outbreak in the hospital. The oral evidence that was given on her behalf was that, in fact, she had called him because she was worried about her daughter. He had attended with the support, with the agreement of the nurse. The nurse subsequently disputed that, so no problem that it had not been properly cross examined because my client had not expected to give oral, oral evidence, had not proffered a witness. Oh, sorry, just uh, take it in stages. Did your client give evidence about this issue? Yes. Uh, and the, the, the nurse, was the nurse who gave evidence about it called? Yes, it's her. Yes, it wasn't one of the anonymous nurses, it was, <coughs> it was the nurse who gave evidence. Yes, but she was giving evidence about what, she, she wasn't the nurse present at the scene, as it were. Oh right, so, yeah. the, nurse, so the, nurse, the, present, the nurse who's the direct witness did not give evidence. I will check so, my so the, my well, so the evidence against your client was the hearsay evidence from Nurse T about what the other nurse had said your client had done. Yes, but I will I, I will check my notes on that and, and, con and confirm it in, in reply. And or just just uh, to be absolutely okay. clear on that. And then the other evidence about it was given by your client. Yes. And did uh, the father give evidence about that matter as well? Yes. And his evidence was also that he had come because his daughter was in distress. Okay. In any event, my lord... The judge seems to have rejected their evidence. Yeah. In any event, my lord, the basis of this injunction, which was brought in December of 2021, or brought in April <coughs> of 2022, yeah. it supported the judgment in December 2021, was because of the allegation of difficult behaviours which made the move for G to the care home problematic. In my submission, it is not enough to refer to an incident two years previously 
as justification for granting an injunction. Well, the evidence against your client on which matters upon which the judge relied in extending the injunction to your client were not confined to that. Yes, they were. No, it wasn't. He, he talked about your client's a, a, uh, attitude court. that he was in total agreement. She was in total agreement with the father that she gave him 100 support on everything. Her hostility to the care home is as strong as his. So that was presumably based on the evidence, her, including her evidence. In terms of her support for her husband, my lord, yes. But in terms of behaviours that were meant to warrant the imposition of an injunction, in my submission, there are none. There are three cases that, that, that sort of come together into this appeal, as it were. The December case, the, I think it's February injunction case, and the June case. In the February case, my client wasn't a party. She was present, present in the court, and there's a passing reference to her yes. in the judgment. That's the uh, reporting. No, that's the best interest decision. The best interest. The December decision. Sorry, the February decision. February is the, is the reporting decision. Yes, December thought, is the best interest I, decision. Sorry, I thought you were talking about the February. Yes, no. Beginning with the December case, um, I don't think you need to turn it up, but if you want to, it's a, a paragraph, it's a tab 12, it's a core bundle. Um, and in that case, there's a, there are two passing references to my client. There's a reference to her rarely going into, sorry, I gestured because I was expecting her to be behind me, but she's not here. I was going to um, say, I hadn't, I hadn't assumed your client was here. No, no, she, she's unwell, so she, so she was not here. She right. had intended to. Uh, he referred to her rarely going into the hospital, taking little of any involvement in her medical case. That's at paragraph 46, just for your notes. And paragraph 54 talks about her profession as a beautician and the seismic changes that will be involved if he comes home. Yes. That's it. In the February reporting restriction case, there's one reference to her, which is at paragraph 29. Where he says, nothing in the above in any way causes me to re revisit my clear finding that LF and his partner love their daughter greatly, have an enormous amount to offer her. That's the only reference. And then in the judgment under appeal, there are references at the beginning to the love and affection and the support given by both parents. Uh, and then, of course, there are the references to which your lordship has already referred about the support given to her husband. So there's a reference at paragraph uh, 46 where uh, the vice no. president refers to her being, it's at page 145, um, where my client is criticised for not having her glasses and for the fact that she doesn't have her glasses at the previous hearing, notwithstanding that, of course, on both occasions she wasn't anticipating giving evidence, not least because in this case she was only made a party on the first day of the hearing. Mm. Uh, there's a reference to her paragraph 46 complete blind and unquestioning support of her husband mm -hmm. that's the, what you've already been referring to my lord there's no suggestion from the trust evidence of the nurses that they fear active behaviours from her there's no suggestion that she engages in any of the behaviours uh, which her partner denies but of which she is accused um, in those circumstances in my submission it was neither just and convenient, nor was it necessary to grant an injunction. The only basis on which I would concede it might be would be on the basis of expediency. Um, and given the need of the court to act justly, notwithstanding the statutory provision which may require expediency alone, in my submission it would be unjust in those circumstances to put my client under the threat of imprisonment or nothing more than support of her husband. Um, well, well, very often when one grants injunctions against the primary defendant, um, there's obviously consideration of how that may be circumvented. <coughs> and in commercial cases, 
very often bonds and junk uh, associated companies or agents or whatever. If you have um, a, a partner who is um, closely supportive of <coughs> the actions which have taken place so far, which are sought to be curtailed, and the science has also signed some of the correspondence. No? No, right. no, she didn't sign some, any of the correspondence. I think there's one, there's an email which has her name on it, and the, the judge accepts in the judgment that he thinks she was aware of the broad import of, of the email, but probably hadn't even read it. He says that her name is included on the correspondence. On the email, include. In, this is one, yes. one. I mean, it, it's a nice And the pa paragraph, will talk, last part of 46 is where he deals with that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but the. Um, there, there would obviously be a very easy way to circumvent the injunctions if the correspondence which had previously been written by LS would now be just simply sent in M's name. And, and that, would, that would be a very easy way of simply avoiding the whole effect of the injunction. So is, doesn't that make it necessary uh, to injunct her as well. If, if there were reasons to consider that that, that might be, it's a, it's a Timio Timis point. Well, isn't it, her, isn't, uh, it the judge's findings is that uh, they are in total agreement, no light and shade. M gives her partner 100% support on everything. Her hostility to the care home is every bit as strong as his. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, that is the judge's findings after having seen your client in the witness box. Yes, my lord, <coughs> in terms of support, but not in terms of, of the behaviours that he thinks she has engaged in or does in, or is likely to engage in. He talks about the fact that she rarely uses her mobile phone, that she is not she doesn't engage with social media, that she is, he talks about the isolation in which, in fact, forgive me, I'm, I should bring it up to put it in front of you. For, uh, 47, isn't it? He talks about her social isolation. Yeah, he says, he says at 47. Yeah, I, by line 12, I'm struck by what I regard as M's social isolation. Is that the passage you mean? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to find it because I think it's actually in my skeleton argument. Uh, but he also talks about the fact that she doesn't engage with social media, that she rarely uses her mobile phone. Yes, he does. He does. He does. I was beginning at 47. I'm grateful, my lord. Um, in, in those circumstances, it's not. I, I, I entirely take your point, my lord, that you know, if you said, well, they both write letters, if we injunct him, she'll just simply start writing them herself. And I can see that, see the sense that you might say, well, you would injunct them both. But in these, these circumstances, there had been explicit evidence accepted by the judge that she didn't do those things. That her husband might read them aloud and she might say yes. But she didn't even use her mobile phone. In those circumstances, saying that it was necessary to injunct her, put her under the threat of a prison sentence, in, in my submission, is unsustainable. But she isn't a, a threat of a prison sentence if she isn't going to do anything. Mm. I'm well, not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's that point, isn't it? We don't, we don't have the authority here. I think it's, I think it's re F. It's an old case in which. Court of Appeals say, notwithstanding that the provisions of an injunction may be ostensibly minor, the fact that they come with them, the possibility of a prison sentence, makes them draconian orders. And in my submission, notwithstanding that, of course, my client would say she, she has never done any of these things and she doesn't intend to transgress any of them. Although, having said that, some of the restrictions have always been disputed by all the appellants as necessary in terms of. There are restrictions on, on their ability to provide emergency care when they're out, of, out and about with their children, which they still consider to be problematic. Um, we're, we're not being asked to sort of fine tune. No, the absolutely. Casual. We're being addressed on the basis of yes. the question principle. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, I think that you rightly um, reminded us and, and yourself that, that we're in a pallet court. Um, given that the judge had, had formed the about your client, um, on what 
basis could we um, take the view he was not entitled to come into the view that in order to make his order effective it was necessary or expedient and or just and convenient if you prefer to join um, M as a party to the injunction because in my submission the judge's finding the conclusions refer to her support they don't refer to her actions and the injunction is on her actions it's not on her support to the party and in those circumstances it didn't meet either the just and convenient or the necessary or expedient standard but we have in in uh, the world of freezing injunctions um, the court frequently injuncts um, innocent third parties under the Chabra injunction, Chabra jurisdiction, um, where they happen to hold assets, um, which uh, and they've done nothing wrong at all. There's no, there's no, not even a cause of action against them. Um, but that's because it's necessary to do so in order to preserve the asset. Um, and here, what's been done is it is to preserve the right of uh, G to accept the claim. And, and if you're right that M is um, uh, uh, not going to take any such step, then uh, so be it. But is it not uh, understandable from the judge's point of view that somebody who's fully supportive of the actions which are being enjoined? Um, and has had some involvement in them, albeit people not extensive, it would be it's appropriate that they should be enjoined too. Otherwise, there's a serious likelihood that the place will be lost because actions will be taken by M because uh, um, she's not enjoined um, and nothing can be done about it. But in my submission, you, you can't get to that threshold. I mean, you can't say that there's serious possibility of, of, of things being done. You can't meet the, the red and brick test of saying, you know, there isn't a fear that manifests itself because there is no evidence of wrongdoing in the past, save for the <coughs> support of her husband and one incident two years previously where undisputed facts... Did she offer undertaking? That was, that was not offered and I have asked instructions on that point not canvassed in the hearing below because they were offered by uh, her husband and, and not <coughs> accepted. In those circumstances, it wasn't pursued, but I can make instructions on that. You know, orders of this sort are very commonly made in the family courts against, say, a, a grandparents, for hypothetical example, example of disrupting a placement of some sort, where one of the one of the couple is a is the principal protagonist, but the other one is 100% supportive. And even if there's no evidence that the junior partner, as it were, has done anything active, that support is regarded as sufficient to justify, in order to provide protection for the child, to justify the extension of the injunction to the junior partner. Now, given the judge's findings about the need for an injunction, if that's the basis on this, on which you have to make this submission, and his findings in paragraph 47, why, how do you say that we can intervene? Well, it, in my submission, we're talking about a different jurisdiction, obviously. There, there are several authorities, I think it's DL, which talks about the difference between the inherent of jurisdiction course, of and this course. jurisdiction. And, and, you know, we're not in the wardship jurisdiction. No. Men, we're in a protective child, jurisdiction. About the, and the, the, the point makes we're, we're in the protective jurisdiction. But the, but the jurisdiction is, is, is more circumcised, in my submission. And, and in, those, in those circumstances, Extending the injunction purely on the basis of support <coughs> for a loved one, nothing more, in my submission, is an overreach of power. It's not just support. It's not just support. Yeah. On the judge's findings, her hostility is every bit as strong as his. Hostility, yes, but in my submission, it, it is an emotional uh, presentation rather than an active practice. And, and in the realms of injunctions, we're talking about the restriction of an active practice, in my submission. And even in the commercial cases, and I, I of course, do not want to go to the table with Justice Phillips on, on, on such an area of law. But on my understanding, there would need to be, you would need to understand that there are assets available or some, some cause of action to, to begin pursuing. You, it, it's not open to 
Justin jumped anybody, anywhere. Well, you definitely don't need a, you de definitely don't need a cause of action. No. That's why they're called non cause yes. of action defendants. Yes, quite so. But they do have to have assets, otherwise there's no point in injuncting them. And assets which are are in some way engaged in in, 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 in the case in issue. It's not. I, I, I know. I, I, I see the Duvalier and Hayter case, which is referenced in, in Carson, one of the authorities that we got in the bundle. I, I appreciate that the reach can be very far, but in my submission, it has to have a basis on which it can be made, particularly given the implications for it. And and in my submission, emotional support is insufficient. To what extent was the judge in making this decision entitled to take into account the crucial, as he saw it, the crucial importance of this placement, which he stresses? <coughs> In both of the principal judgments in this, all the judgments in this case, the absolute importance of this placement in the care home going ahead, the the the, the fact that she'd been that G had been in a pediatric unit for years after she attained her majority, the difficulties in finding anywhere else, the harm that was she was at risk she was suffering, my parent, my words not his. Wasn't that something which the judge had to take into account in considering the necessity or expediency or convenience or justness, justice of making an order? I recognise that those, those matters were an issue. It is relevant. But they weren't an issue. Were, were an issue. Okay, they were an issue. But they were decided, by, I, but as far as this case, this judge was concerned, they weren't an issue. That, that is the basis for which the judge proceeded. That, 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 that G needed this placement more than anything as a matter of the utmost urgency in her interest. But it, in my submission, it doesn't follow that G needed an injunction. No, it doesn't follow that she needed. But in, in assessing whether the injunction should extend to your client, wasn't the judge entirely taken to account the crucial importance of the placement as he had found it to be? He was. But in my, you know, my submission, it extends too far to bring in every collateral decision relevant to that to say, be, because the ultimate goal is a move to the care home, any collateral decision that I consider expedient to that can be made. In my submission, that extends the powers of district bar. Can I, can I put this to you? Injunctions restraining future behaviour are always based on court's perception that there's a risk of that behaviour. You can't prove that something is going to happen. The law is not so <coughs> stupid to think that you can, but the, the law requires judgment, judges to perform an assessment of whether there's a real risk of something happening. And if there is a real risk of something happening in the judge's perception, then the judge has powers to injunct it. Those sorts of decisions are very much evaluative decisions grounded on the judge's judicial experience, the type of case, the evidence, <coughs> his perception of the witnesses. They're very difficult for this court to replicate. And it's also very difficult to lay down <coughs> strict parameters saying, unless you have evidence of X, you can't do Y. They have to be holistic decisions based on all the factors which I've mentioned. Is that, is that not a basis for saying, it's not what we might have done, but it's what this judge, having heard your client and the other witnesses, and having all the evidence, and having the background, and his judicial experience, he's a very experienced judge in this particular field, um, can form a view that there is a risk which he thinks needs to be protected. <coughs> yes, but in my submission, there still has to be an entry level determination of the Was 
that I've done in the court of an equivalent risk. The analysis is in terms of what might be helpful to the placement. But it's not saying I must injunct the, the father because if I don't, the mother will do X. Unless I've missed it, that's not what's in the judgment. It's that it would be helpful to the care home if I injuncted them all. It would probably be helpful to the care home if you injuncted everybody they knew. But that can't be the test, can it? It's not just what's expedient, it's what's just. Well, thank you, Ms. Cohen. You've been very, very helpful and responded to our <coughs> pressing criticisms or questions or challenges in a very admirable way. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Brownhill. Just uh, rearrange the furniture for a second. Yes. My Lord, in respect of my submissions on behalf of the grandmother, um, can I start, please, by just pointing out some of the procedural matters that occurred within the court below. Uh, and the first of those, my lords, was the fact that in respect to the grandmother, she was not somebody who had in any great way, shape or form actively participated in these proceedings. She wasn't a party in December. She wasn't. She wasn't a party. Was she in February? She wasn't. My lord. No. In fact, what happened was, although the application <coughs> for the injunction was issued in April, on the 1st of June, she was with uh, G in the hospital ward, a process server arrived on the hospital ward and she was handed with the application. So that was the 1st of June and then the hearing was on the 8th of June. Mm. She was represented? She wasn't represented. She wasn't represented. She wasn't That's represented in the court below. She attended the hearing remotely. Oh yes, that's right. She didn't, my understanding at least, my learned friends will correct me, she didn't attend for the whole thing because she was with G, actively by her side, actively engaged in care and such like, and rather instead simply gave evidence, responded to the Vice President's questions, and then the injunction was imposed upon her. So my lords, it's with that backdrop that we make the application today for leave to appeal and to appeal in this case in respect of three issues, uh, the first of which has been traversed by my learned friends, <coughs> that being the test for the injunction itself. The second being, although I don't want to go into it in granular detail, some of the prohibitions within the injunction and whether the court actually had the power to make them. You'll have to remind me where that's anticipated in your notice of appeal. I will do, my lord. I'll take you to it. Uh, and then finally, the process, the procedural justice aspects in respect of making the injunction in particular, that in the <coughs> grandmother's case, allegations against her were not particularised ahead of the injunction hearing. As I said, I, I don't, in respect to the first issue, intend to traverse what my learned friends have said, but rather would adopt it uh, to a very large extent. But perhaps can I uh, go back to basics, perhaps at the wrong point in the day, but just to be clear what the grandmother says the process will be for when the Court of Protection makes any decision. This is covered in your skeleton. <coughs> it, it is covered, yes. Um, it's at paragraph 23 of my yeah. skeleton article. Can I just get it up? Just give me a moment. 23A through to D are not considered to be controversial. Perhaps E slightly is. 
But, but in every case where the Court of Protection is making a decision on behalf of P, the first stage will always be to identify what the decision is. Then the Court will determine whether or not P is able to take that decision for themselves. And if P is not able to take that decision for themselves, then the Court applies the best interest checklist contained within Section 4 of the Act and takes the decision for them. And the way in which the Court takes the decision on behalf of a person is the Court essentially makes an order giving effect to it. P well, or makes a declaration. Or makes a declaration by law. So in respect of the, the usual course of things, the order might be that P's house is sold to pay for care fees. It might be that P moves from one address to another address. It might be that P <coughs> no longer receives life-sustaining treatment. In this case, it was a what the judge said is declared and ordered pursuant to Section 16.2. Yes. That, and then the Court decides on P's behalf that she should accept discharge from the hospital to the care home identified by the applicant CG, PCG. My Lord, yes, absolutely. So it's a relatively straightforward decision that was made. It's one that's made by the Court of Protection day in, day out, at every tier of judiciary. Your list in paragraph 23 could perhaps be expanded to say that uh, after D, D1, or D whatever, and makes uh, ancillary orders under 16.5 as may be necessary or expedient. Yes, so, so, quite, so for example, my Lord, if your Lordships were dealing with a case whereby someone was moving out of their home address into a care home, mm. there could be in some circumstances an ancillary order that that person has their property conveyed to the care home along with them or thereafter. Uh, there could be, for example, a uh, what's known as a transition plan where the care and support that's taking place um, in the intervening period. Well, all these orders, all these orders on the judge made on the in December, I say all of them, the orders made, yes, under the heading, it is further ordered and directed, were orders made under 16.5, weren't they? So in terms of the... Best interest, being a best interest meeting, plan, disclosure. So my Lord, certainly in respect of things like um, transition planning, how one goes from one mm. place to another. Yeah. I totally agree, my that's what, that, that is what 16.5 is all about. A paradigm for 16.5. On your case, that's what it's about. It doesn't extend to the injunction. Absolutely, my lord. Because what we say is that when one starts to look for something more substantive, and in this case, the imposition of an injunction, one is then moving out of section 16.5, is moving into... Because you've drafted 23.3e. It, the court does first consider whether it's necessary and expedient. And if it does consider it necessary and expedient, then goes on to consider whether it's just and convenient. My, my Lord, yes, because this is where I slightly divert from another friend, uh, Mr. McKendrick, Queen's Council, because what I'm effectively arguing for is a, a sequential way forward. Because in my submission, one starts with the least restrictive, and that is a, a principle of the Act. And the least restrictive uh, intervention that the court will usually make is a decision whether or not somebody has contact with somebody else. And the court may say, you're not having contact with your family friend, um, but that sometimes doesn't work. So sometimes the court makes an order. The court's order might be that contact is supervised. It might be that contact can only take place in a public area where yes. it's being surveilled. But when one then steps forward into an injunction, then we say, the other person's rights are becoming more acutely involved, and that's where we say the just and convenient test comes in. Yes. So you say it is a two. You say it's a two-stage process. Yes, ma'am. It has to be not work. Stepping back more than two stages, as you said. It's a graduated. A graduated. Yes, ma'am. But before you get to the, before you can make an injunction, first of all, you have to make a decision in the, in P's best interest. Yes. Then you have to consider what ancillary orders are made. Yes, my lord. And to, before you can make it, they have to be necessary and expedient. Yes. And if you decide that you want to make such an order, but it is of the nature of an injunction, you then have to ask yourself if it's just or convenient. My lord, That's yes. your scheme. My lord, that is my <coughs> scheme. 
And I hope that if one looks at at least one of the decisions that the court has made previously, albeit a more extreme example, that it carries through. So within the bundle, okay. at, behind tab 45 is the SF note. Yeah. SF was my lord, a young woman of 20 years of age who was living uh, in supported living accommodation. She was being contacted by a variety of different men via yes. social media who were essentially sexually exploiting her. So in that case, the local authority came before the court and identified essentially three separate decisions. Uh, the first decision was in respect of her contact with these men. The second was her ability to use the internet and social media. And the third was, as it was couched at the time, her capacity to engage, well, capacity to consent to sexual relations. So that's what it was at that point. Under the old formulation. Under the old formulation, my lord, yes. Then, moving forwards, we see that she was found to, this is at paragraph four of the judgment, lack the capacity to make decisions as to have contact with others and in use of social media and internet. And one of the men that the local authority identified as being particularly exploitative was a individual known as BK. And so in the circumstances, the local authority applied for an injunction against BK from contacting her or visiting her accommodation. And the issue which arose before Mr Justice Keown was he asked, did he have the power to make an injunction using the Mental Capacity Act? Or alternatively, did he have to resort to the invocation of the inherent jurisdiction? And so the judgment in SF is not focused on the test, but it was focused on the court being satisfied that it had the power to make an injunction when it wasn't explicitly provided for within the text of section 16. When one looks to his reasoning, it follows through the next pages. He talks about on page 1,108 of paragraph 12, he talks about the establishment of the court and mentions <coughs> section 45 of the Mental Capacity Act. He then goes through and reminds himself of section 47 and section 48, so the, uh, the powers being the same powers as that of the High Court. And then says at paragraph 13, the power of High Court to grant interlocutory injunctions derives from section 37. He takes all of the authorities together, which were put before him, in respect of the power to make injunctions, reminds himself then at paragraph 20 that he has the same powers, rights, and privileges as the High Court and the same injunctive power under section 37. And then, my lord, almost working backwards through the process that we dealt with just a few moments ago, in paragraph 33, he gives his reasons for finding that the Court of Protection does have the power to make injunctions. He says at Roman 1, Section 27 of the Act is drafted in wide terms. It must follow, looking to uh, Section 37 of the 1981 Act, that he had the power to grant injunctive relief. He then fortified that with Section 17 of the Mental Capacity Act, which explicitly refers to making orders in respect of contact between named individuals. And then he mentions Section 16.5 and the breadth of drafting within it. So my, in my submission, that authority 
although not addressing explicitly what the test is, follows the rubric and effectively uses section 16.5 as a bridge. It says once you have your section 16.2 decision made, your order made, you then almost go up through a graduated process and look at other orders that it's necessary for you to make. And one of those orders might be that which is set out in section 17. But it may be necessary to go beyond that and to go to the Senior Courts Act to have the ability to impose an injunction. Okay. Do you accept that in exercising its powers under section 16, the court has to act justly? Of course not. In what sense, then, is there a material difference between the test under section 16 with that important qualification and the test under the uh, 1981 Act, section 37? Because, my lord, section 16 is focused going backwards to section 4. Section 16 decisions are all through the lens of best interests. The best interest of only one person, and that is he, the protected party. So what does justly add, then? Justly adds the balancing exercise between the best interests of P, which has already been determined through section 4 and section 16, and then adds in the rights of other individuals. Yeah, well, that's right. But, but in I thought you would agree that in exercising its power under section 16, the court has to act justly. Absolutely, but the court's, the court's statutory exercise and the court's statutory duty is to look at those factors in section 4 on the checklist. And they are prescribed. The court is told it can look at these things only. So the difficulty that the court has is importing the idea that the court will act justly. Is the court's starting point will always be, in those circumstances, to look at what is the best outcome for P. And that is what will drive them. And that's what we say happened in the present case. Because what I say on behalf of the grandmother in the present case is that the Vice President was driven to getting to the best outcome for P, but what he didn't do was pause and say, actually, looking at the breadth of this injunction of sorts, looking at the overall circumstances, how do I balance this against the rights of family members, and in particular, the grandmother? And so it's that balancing exercise. There was discussion this morning about the, um, the impact that the Human Rights Act has. And the Human Rights Act must have an impact in respect of the, the way in which that section is interpreted. But we're not only dealing necessarily with convention rights. We can be dealing with other issues as well. Because the court could be asked to make a whole host of different types of injunctions or different types of order in particular cases. For example, the court might be asked, the court might decide that husband and wife, uh, it's in the best interests of uh, the husband not to see his wife. They might live together. The court then may be asked to remove somebody out of their own home using those powers under Section 16. Now, in those circumstances, there is a clash of rights, potentially. The Court of Protection will be driven to what is in the best interests of P, who is the protected party within these proceedings. What the Court is not driven to, by the statutory language in those circumstances, is the balancing exercise that is contained within Section 37, when one looks at something justly. Effectively, my argument is the Section 16 approach constrains the court, understandably perhaps, considering what the Court of Protection is about, it constrains the court to looking at P and the best outcome for them. It doesn't incorporate properly the rights of others, and that's what we say renders that application of the test in that way wrong. Now, my fallback position building on what Lord Phillips asked this morning was, what, what would happen if one looked at the wording of the section and said, well, essentially, one has to incorporate virtually a similar test to section 37. So one has to say, 
when exercising section 16.5, uh, one has to look at whether it's just to make an injunction in those types of circumstances. And again, the outcome would be the same, we said. But what there has to be is there has to be, when the Court of Protection is making any form of injunction, there has to be that balancing exercise. Otherwise, one is focused entirely on the best interest of the protected party and not thinking of others. That must be entirely uncontroversial. It couldn't possibly be right for a grant injunction looking only at the interests of the one party. Well, I, I really hope that's right, Michael, because that's effectively our case. Because what we say happened was that the Vice President focused entirely on the best interests of the people. Well, I don't understand it to be the respondent's case, the response to this appeal case, that uh, you do only look at best interests. I'm sorry, Mark. That you do only look at best interests. They're, they're, there's not, they accept that, it has to, that there is an element of justly. Well, I think that the... Uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of another premise, Ray, because she'll do a much better job for herself later or tomorrow, but she suggests in her uh, written submissions that there could alternatively be two different <coughs> tests, that there could be two routes, one of which is through Section 16.5, the other is through the Senior Courts Act. Mm. And we say that can't possibly be right. There must only be well, one route, but and whatever the route, it must involve... What I've been trying right. to make for a few minutes is, is that, is that the, the, the structure of the, the Court of Protection, mm. through the rules, through the overriding objectives, incorporates justly as every decision. Every decision has to be a just decision. It must be, my rule. Absolutely. But what the... I suppose if you like, where the statute falls down, is that firstly, section 16 doesn't mention the word injunction, and secondly, it doesn't say when you're making this particular type of order, when you're concerned with injunctions, you must balance the rights of others. And if we get to that, um, if we get to that end, and everyone agrees about that in the end, I don't really about, mind about the journey and how we get there. But that must be something which is made explicit to every lower court in the country. Because otherwise... Well, it's, it's, it's there in the overriding objective. <laughs> How more explicit do you want it to be? Well, my Lord, I think the difficulty is that when we're talking about the... Um, when we're talking about injunctions within the Court of Protection, we've already had one case where the Court has asked, does it have the power to make such an injunction? We then have this case where we're talking about the test, the procedure, the scope of the injunction that can be made, and we're dealing with a piece of primary legislation, which is what any judge should be looking to first, and the judge will ask themselves, in a busy list, what is my power? Uh, and so in my submission, what there has to be is clarity based on the text rather than on the rules. Because the rules, again, whilst the overriding objective, of course, imports a requirement for parties to be treated in a way which is just, again, where it falls down is it doesn't talk about the balancing of rights. Because why would it talk about the balancing of rights? Because it's talking about features of Section 4, which is the best interest of the protected person. Well, balancing of rights, is a, that's a new concept you're introducing now. I, I, my, I hope I'm not introducing a new concept. I hope rather instead I'm simply piggybacking on the concept of what is just and convenient. Because we would say that that concept of being acting in a way which is just would always involve that balancing type of exercise. without traversing what my other friends said and recognising that I'm standing in an appellate court and I wasn't in the court below, one of the difficulties in the 16 5 approach is that the family are almost treated like an amalgamated unit rather than there having been an individual consideration of each of the appellants and what was necessary or what was just and convenient in respect of each of them. And in that respect, I'd ask the court to look again at uh, page 
page 123 of the core bundle. said it's plain therefore that both M and N are not only entirely supportive of LF's campaign, but they're also likely to become embroiled in the execution of a plan to derail the placement. It's for that reason that I've come to the conclusion that the injunctive relief sought is with respect to both of them entirely necessary. The scope and ambit of relief is to put in place clear boundaries to manage the family's behaviour. My submission is that if you take the almost mechanical approach that I had set out earlier, what in reality the court ought to have done is to have considered in respect of each of the appellants whether it was just and convenient in the circumstances to impose the injunction sought against them rather than looking at the family as an amalgamated unit. It must be M in the next line, is it not N? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my Lord, moving then to my uh, second submission in respect of the way in which the injunction was made. And again, I don't intend to traverse the uh, arguments made this morning by my learned friends, but one of the points put this morning was in respect of the court making Section 16 decisions. My learned friends were asked if the court makes a section 16 decision about how care is received, could that be something that is then placed into an order and then potentially into an injunction? And again, the answer to that must be yes. Where we said that the court went too far in this case is in respect of those issues or those prohibitions on the face of the order which were outside of the scope of what Nikita herself could do. Those matters go beyond the analysis and the, the mechanism that I put forward earlier in respect of how Section 16 works, and we say would therefore fail. So if uh, the court looks at page 102 of the court bundle, sees there the terminology of the prohibitions and at 4 Roman 1 there is the prohibition as to how the grandmother, the father and mother communicate with the staff servants and employees of the hospital and care home in particular how they are prohibited from using intimidating, threatening challenging, rude or abusive words. <clears throat> hmm? This type of prohibition and the ones that follow on from it are the types of prohibition that are not things that Nikita herself could have decided. Please try to remember the injunction. I'm so sorry, sorry, my lord. These are not the types of prohibition that G herself could have made, they are rather um, things that fall outside a best interest decision. 
the court could not make a best interest decision or assess Jean's capacity as to how her family members uh, talk This takes us back to the point about section 16.5. It does. And whether every order under 16.5 has to be something which G herself could have done. Absolutely, my lord. But it also comes to, and I adopt what my learned friend said in that regard, but, but I also come to the point which is in respect of this type of prohibition appearing in this type of order is odd in circumstances where both the criminal and civil law have a comprehensive statutory scheme as to this type of behaviour. And that comprehensive scheme is the Protection from Harassment Act. The Protection from Harassment Act sets out clearly that one ha can put in place civil protections or one can criminalise behaviour that crosses a line in that which is described within paragraph. The fact that there the, 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 are those statutory provisions, why does that mean that the, 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 the Court of Protection can't make orders of this sort? Well, my Lord, because Parliament has, in, has expressly set out a scheme that deals with that issue, we would say that that is where the source of that power comes from. Are you arguing this runs against the statutory scheme? My Lord, yes, because the way in which the statutory scheme works that's set out within the Protection from Harassment Act... Have you got, have you got that? Yes, my Lord. Three. It's in three, my Lord, yes. Excuse me, this, this isn't... We're not simply not in the territory of protection from harassment here, are we? This is, this is not um, persons coming to court saying, I need to be protected against harassment. This is um, a judge saying that in order to give effect to my section 16c decision, I need to make these further orders to stop that being circumvented by action undertaken, which would cause the placement to be deferred or locked. Yeah. And we're a million miles away from uh, somebody uh, seeking a protection from harassment injunction. My Lord, in cases whereby um, persons arrive at public buildings, like hospitals or schools, and they harass the staff inside, the means of protecting the staff is through the Protection from Harassment Act. That's not what we're engaged in here. But that's what the court prohibited. The court prohibited conduct. What the court prohibited is conduct which was likely to delay or prevent the, um, the um, G um, accepting the offer of a place at the care home. My Lord, in respect of that, what effectively the Court of Protection was being invited to do was to, um, if you like, put in place particular restrictions on the grandmother with a third party, an unspecified person employed by the place where the Court had determined that G ought to be discharged to. Forgive me, I, I, I must admit, for my part, I'm finding this very um, necessarily complex and confusing. We, it's been well established, and doesn't seem to be here anyone dispute, that the Court of Protection has its own jurisdiction to grant an injunction. It does, my Lord. Under Section 47, if not under Section 16. Yes, my Lord. And that is undoubtedly being exercised in this case to give effect to an order under Section 16.2. Why do we need to get into an entirely separate regime under the Protection from Harassment Act, which nobody sought to invoke, nobody sought to be um, uh, making orders pursuant to. Um, and the fact that it may have parallels to this regime doesn't seem to me to take the matter anywhere. Well, uh, the reason why I raise it, and perhaps again, it's, it's my ignorance for not being below, was that when the Vice President was addressed, he was said, it was said to him explicitly that the conduct indulged in by the grandmother and the mother would not cross the threshold to meet the test under the Protection from Harassment Act. And so, again, what the court was 
being asked to do was to replicate the type of prohibition that would be more commonly used in the civil court elsewhere, in the criminal court elsewhere, to regulate that type of <coughs> conduct. So, for example, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, but, so are you saying with that, to, the, was the point being made on behalf of, of the uh, one or one of the appellants? My Lord, I understand from the written submissions filed by the official solicitor okay. that uh, in closing submissions that it was said that it was accepted by the trust that it wouldn't cross the threshold under the protection of the Paris Convention. And the reason why I raise it now is perhaps not in this scenario. Perhaps, perhaps this is where I'm perhaps making it more confusing. But where one imagines that somebody is already in a care home and their family members become difficult. At that stage, the court couldn't be asked to exercise any powers under Section 16.5 because the person's already there. What they're being asked to do is to regulate the behaviour between people who aren't P and the employees of the care home. Well, well um, I hope the officials will forgive, me, will forgive me if I say, so what, to her submission? I mean, <laughs> I mean is, the point is, what is required what is under 16.5, what is necessary uh, and expedient to, uh, for the, to further the decision, to sub supplement the decision under 16.2. Well, the, the fact that they decide to make an order which wouldn't have crossed the, wouldn't have crossed the, if, if, if it was right, wouldn't have crossed the 90, 97 Act threshold. Is with respect to the business, I would thought neither here nor there. Uh, I may be doing her an injustice, in which case I apologise. No, but I, but I hear what I hear what you're saying. I think that I think the difficulty conceptually is the idea that, but for the fact that um, the vice president was ordering her to be moved, there doesn't seem on the analysis to be any power by which he could have made that order otherwise. But but <laughs> one thing that is clear is what the vice president thought he was doing preserving the placement. He, in his judgment he refers to derailing, in his order yes. he refers to jeopardizing. Yes, and, and the entire injunction, which I accept has a, quite a lot of different elements to it, including this element, which is, is not directed against protecting G from harassment. Yes. But I don't think, picking up my Lord or Justice Phillips point, it's not really directed at protecting the Care Homes employees yeah. from harassment. It's directed at protecting the placement, yeah. at, at, at preventing the risk of derailing or jeopardizing. Now, I could understand a submission which says, logically, this injunction does nothing to achieve that. that, 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 that there's a logical disconnect between what's injuncted and the, and the risk of jeopardize, jeopardizing or derailing the placement. But if you accept the Vice President was entitled to take the view that this behaviour which he's seeking to restrain might jeopardise or derail the placement. And in, in line with my Lords, I don't see that it matters whether it does or doesn't cross the threshold in the Protection from Harassment Act, because it's not about protecting anybody from harassment. It's about protecting G's right to have a placement which he has decided under Section 16.2 in December is the right place for her. Uh, and, and my Lord, I fully accept <laughs> what your Lordship is saying in that regard. But again, from experience, the way in which those types of prohibition are couched normally is not in terminology like this, which more commonly appears in PHA injunctions, but more in terminology such as not to obstruct. Yes, but he has heard of Again, we come back to the fact that he's had the evidence of he has haven't, but, but it's quite apparent from his quite lengthy recital of the evidence in, in the judgment, long, longer than might commonly be done, that, that um, and I accept this is primarily directed at the father, you have a separate point, that, that it, it, it's not really directed to your client, but a, a pattern of behaviour which, which he thinks um, is does involve risks to the, to the yes, placement. Sir. There's nothing wrong. 
it seems to me, in spelling out in, in quite detailed terms what it is that mustn't be done. I mean, in fact, in general terms, it's much better if injunctions are clear as to what someone can and can't do. Simply saying, don't obstruct the placement, might leave it very open to argument whether a particular behaviour did or didn't yes, my Lord. infringe that. So saying, don't be abusive, don't be whatever the other words challenging. He used are um, intimidating, threatening, challenging, rude, or abusive. It does make it much clearer what it is <laughs> that he doesn't want done. My Lord, well, I, I, I don't see what's wrong with that if if he can do it at all. My Lord, I, I, as I said, I think the position was that we have taken that only in these circumstances could he have done it. The usual course is that uh, it would usually be not to instruct, obstruct, and Whereas, where in the protection from harassment act there is a statutory defence, the way in which um, the vice president took it from the court below didn't really think about whether or not circumstances like a statutory defence would arise because they don't arise in the face of the act. But that perhaps takes me back to my first ground um, rather than advance this one. But what is the relevant statutory defence? So, my lord, in the um, in the protection from harassment act. We look at behind tab three, page twenty-five. Yeah, there are three statutory defences prescribed in section one three. The first doesn't apply in respect of preventing or detecting crime. The second is in respect of any enactment of law. Again, but the third is a more broad category, which is that the circumstances of the suit in course of conduct is reasonable. Uh, my lord, in the grandmother's case, she was very clear before the vice president in writing and orally that she considered that everything she had done was reasonable. And she disputed the suggestion that was she was somehow involved in a conspiracy or a decision or a plan to destabilize the hospital or indeed the fugitive placement. This is about a criminal offence. And a civil wrong. And a civil wrong. But it's, it doesn't mean that, all, that no other type of harassment or behaviour akin to harassment can be prevented by injunction in, other, in any other circumstance. My, my Lord, I'm, I, perhaps I'm not saying it. And, and surely... OK. My, my Lord, perhaps what I'm saying is it would be an oddity in the circumstances to have a mature, well-established regime in dealing with the type of conduct that's prohibited within that prohibition and to simply put it all to one side and to read into it what happened here. Well, the less well, it could be so. We, we've learned over the last, how many years it is, 25 years now since that act was passed. Is that right? Oh, that, that, that abuse and harassment and that sort of behaviour needs even greater protection in certain circumstances. Well, my Lord, yes, and in those circumstances, and this moves to my third point, that the person has to be aware of what it is said that they are doing that requires those... So we're now moving to the specifics of your client. We are. OK, well, I think we'd like to hear you on that. Um, and my Lord, in respect of that, the starting point really is that nothing was particularised against the grandmother ahead of that hearing. I've made the point earlier that she was a litigant in person. I made the point when she received the papers. Uh, and taking up your Lordship's points earlier about the overriding objective within the Court of Protection rules, the overriding objective says at 1.13d oh. that the Court is required to ensure that parties are on an equal footing. And we would submit that in respect of putting the parties on an equal footing, it was necessary for the grandmother to know why it was that there was such a concern of the trust and the ICB or the CCG found it necessary to apply to the court in order for this injunction. Well, there was an application, the application extended to her. Absolutely, my Lord, yes. And there was evidence in support of it. There was, my Lord. Oh. Um, and then, did the, and the deponent of that evidence 
that statement was available for cross-examination? My Lord, um, I couldn't say for certainty. I assume that they, I assume they were. And I accept the point about your, your client being in person, but she gave evidence. Did she file a statement herself? She did, my Lord. She did? Yes. And then she was cross-examined on it? She was, my Lord. So she... All right. She didn't so, ask for an adjournment. My Lord. She didn't ask for an adjournment. My Lord, I'm, I'm not entirely clear about that point. I, I've been told, but again, I wasn't there, that she didn't apply for an adjournment, but she did mention trying to get a lawyer. But again, I'm, I'm not sure where that went, and so I didn't plead it in respect of, uh, in respect of the appeal. We don't have her witness statement, is that right? So, my Lord, in, within, the, within the papers, you have... Just while Mr. Brunhill is, is fine with that, my lord, I, from my recollection, um, the grandmother had sought to instruct counsel, either pro bono or via the advocate scene directly, and they had sought an adjournment of the hearing, but I think it was on the basis that they weren't available for the hearing. But I can, I can check emails to see what was sent to the judge below's clerk, that if further assistance is needed. My Lord, the, uh, the witness statement appears within the bundle at electronic 250, uh, sorry, uh, paginated page 250. This is in the supplementary? In the supplementary bundle, my Lord, yes. And the judge refers to it at uh, 48, doesn't he? Yes, my Lord. Tab 23. Sorry, I missed the paper. So I will take some time. We will eyelash that, and we will look at it over the short, the long adjournment. Um, paragraph forty-eight. Your your client's evidence is summarised there by the judge. It is. Well, essentially, what she was facing was a suggestion that, or conclusion, that in somehow she was someone who was putting the provision at the care home in jeopardy, and that is not what was said to her of the hearing. What was said ahead of the hearing, what appeared within the trust and the CCG's position statement, was that the concern in particular was the fact that the family were opposed to the move, but that it was the behaviour of the father in particular that caused the primary, uh, that caused a company which operated the care home concern. 
Well, the, her statement concludes with the observation that a move to the care home and the enforcement of injunction would be catastrophic for G. Well, yes. And she implored the court to consider returning G to her family home. My lord, yes. I think that actually fits with the earlier judgment of the vice president who saw this as a stepping stone placement, I think, well, at home ultimately. Well, yes, but that's not. The thrust of this is that she is strongly of the view, as set out in this statement, yes, my lord. that G should not go to the care home, but should go home as soon as possible. Uh, absolutely, my lord. Uh, so in that respect, the judge's comment is... Uh, that she is equally determined that her granddaughter should not go to the care home is in accordance with her own evidence. Well, my Lord, in the sense that she thought that there was a better place for G to go, absolutely. But where there is the divergence, my Lord, is in respect of there being evidence and there being particularised allegations of it as to the steps the grandmother would take to jeopardise the placement at the care home. What is it that she would do in that respect? Right. Well, paragraph 49 is the evidence against your client that the judge relied on. Yes, my lord. That she contacted the media <coughs> consultant to orchestrate a press release. That that consultant contacted the care home. That in contacting her, the care home, the media consultant spoke in s s critical terms similar to those deployed by the family. And that the judge rejected your client's assertion that the media consultant, in acting in that way, had been operated entirely without any instruction or encouragement on her part. My lord, yes. Uh, and to be clear, that that point did not appear ahead of the hearing. That point wasn't particularised in any way, shape, or form. And my understanding. Again, no higher because my learned friends were there and I wasn't. My understanding is that that media consultant wasn't called, and there was no opportunity for my client to effectively know that that was going to be used as a means of justifying the imposition of the injunction against her. Well, what the judge says is that what we presumably the media consultant did not give evidence. No. So what the judge is saying here is that in the e her email, the media consultant had expressed herself as effectively acting with your client's authority. That's what the judge says. That she was not challenged by your client on what is now said was a misrepresentation of her authority. So, in other words, what he says is that your client didn't pick her up on what was in the email. And he finds your client's account unconvincing. Marks, my lord, our point again, from a fairness perspective, would be that if that point was going to be put and relied upon, it should have been put and relied upon ahead of the hearing, so she had the opportunity to file evidence in that regard and obtain evidence in that regard. Was she cross-examined about this? I believe so. It does look as though um, your client was had already been served with the application electronically before she was referred to the hospital. My, my understanding, uh, and this is a point I checked quite recently, my understanding is that the service <coughs> was effected by um, delivery, hand delivery by a process server in the ward. I don't believe. Well, she says in her witness statement she'd already been served by email. Right. I don't know when that was in terms of no. that. Um, and she also claimed you also had a copy of what was sought by way of an injunction. I don't know whether she so, the draft order or not. So, my lord, this, this aspect again becomes slightly murkier, and again, apologize, I apologize in advance for deferring to my learned friends. My understanding is there were several different iterations of the proposed injunction and the proposed behavioral contract. The version that was finally made by the vice president is not what she was served. And my understanding, and again, I rely on my learned friends who were there, and I wasn't, was that there were different iterations being worked on during different parts of the hearing. 
Okay. Do we have a copy of what was served on your client? I don't personally know, but uh, Minerva, Mr. Maloney's Queen's Council probably does. Okay. Would it be right to say, and ultimately the judge made the orders against your client and the mother, because they were likely to become embroiled in the execution of the plan to disrail, derail the place. <coughs> That's what he put in paragraph 50. Yes. Was that the essence, as it were, of the argument against your client from the word go on the injunction, or did that only emerge in the course of the hearing? Well, my understanding was that it was seen that uh, the father was the one who was likely to jeopardise the placement, that, they, <coughs> that the mother and the grandmother were sought to be individuals who were against the placement. I don't think, I'm not sure whether it was ever put to her directly that she would well, okay. well, it would be useful to see how it was originally put against your client. I mean, this is yeah. my, the high watermark of your case, your, the, the individual case you're running for your client is fairness of process. Uh, absolutely, my lord, yeah. So, I, I, for my part, I would like to see exactly what was served on your client. Um, well, whatever it was. Well, can, I, can I just give you three references and then sit down and give way to another friend? But in respect of what was put to her, within the supplemental bundle, you will find the position statement of the trust in the ICB. There are three references. The first is okay. page 12. Let's uh, find it. Where is, where is it? Supplemental and then you said you sit down. <laughs> <laughs> supplemental bundle, my lord. Page 12, paragraph 10. reasons for the application are that since mm -hmm. the you've got it, that's fine, yes, moving forward a page my lord, page, paragraph 13, yes, moving forward a page again my lord, page 14, paragraphs 17 and 18. And 19. And 19, my lord. <coughs> yep. My lord, I promise to sit down after giving you this reference. Anything else, Mr. Brown? No, thank you, Mr. Brown. Right, Mr. Malonis. My Lord, good afternoon. Can I pass up a road map? <laughs> um, conscious as I am that there are three appeals, and not all of them overlapping, so there are a number of different issues to be raised. as a result of the questions and the responses this morning, my submissions may be somewhat shorter than I'd originally anticipated. Okay. Under the uh, issue A, whether the judge granted the injunction on the basis that it was necessary or expedient rather than uh, Section 37 test of just and convenient, alternatively, um, that he simply applied the Section 17, 16 and 17 framework without reference to uh, the Supreme Court Act and the Section 47 import of it. Um, there are three subheadings under that. The first is, as a matter of fact, what did the judge decide? The second is whether there is a separate power to grant an injunction under Section 16.5. And the third related issue is whether uh, the interpretation of Section 16.5 advanced by Mr. McKendrick and Ms. Cohn is appropriate and sustainable or not. Can I deal with the first issue, which hasn't really been canvassed um, before you by anybody so far, and that is 
what was actually advanced yeah. in front of the judge. Advanced in advanced. front of the judge. And yes. that is important where criticism is made of him, not least where, and it's important that the context is uh, supplied. This was a two-day hearing that turned into a hearing that I think lasted three and a half days. The closing submissions were given on a Monday, and somewhat lengthy written submissions were advanced by the Father's Council on the Monday. I understand it's only about 45 odd minutes um, before the hearing sat. That is no criticism of those who act for the Father. But it's important to understand when reading the judgment what arguments had been run in front of me. The Trust's position is made very clear in their closing, and that's in the supplementary bundle at page. 59. And I only take you to the headlines because this, although this repeats what was set out in opening, the critical points are set out there and in particular paragraph 38. So the trust position is that the test to be applied by the Vice President in deciding whether or not to grant the injunction was whether it appears to the court to be just and convenient. So we have the section 37.1 test. And then whether it thinks it necessary or expedient for giving effect to its decision. Uh, and that moves on and imports the section 16.5 test. It was not, and never was, the Trust's position that uh, section 16.5 was a provided a standalone power. That was the position of the trust and the, uh, can't now recall whether it was the CCG or the ICB at the time, but the first and second respondents as they now are. It was the position of um, the mother and it was the position of the official solicitor insofar as any detail was provided. Um, there were no detailed submissions in the opening from uh, the father, and no party submitted to the court that there was a freestanding power, independent of section 37, to grant an injunction. So when so the father didn't, make it, didn't address this point? He addressed it in the written closing, and I will come to that. Okay. That's an important Sorry. Point. So that was the trust position and the mother and the OS. And the mother and the OS and the ICB. Yeah. And that's important because when analysing the judgment and the arguments that the okay. judge was grappling with, it would have been striking if he had um, decided to reject the way in which all of the parties advanced the, the legal framework and decided to go off on a frolic of his own. So I'm, I've just, I, I, I skated over something you said. No party advanced the proposition that section 15.5 was a standalone text. Yes. Okay. I don't take you to those, any of the other closing submissions in any detail, but that's, in summary, that's the point. Um, the, that's important because the trust position is fundamentally misstated, both by Ms. Cohn and by Mr. McKendrick. Um, and that, that is likely to lead this court into error. In the uh, mother's closing statement, a uh, closing, forgive me, it's not the closing document, it's the skeleton for this um, case. Mm. Uh, it's at Paragraph 6, forgive me, I don't have the, the electronic number, but it's page 6 within the bundle. 16 and 10, I'm, I'm grateful. And paragraph yeah. 6, where it said, the court below also heard legal submissions by both the first and second appellants at the hearing below to the effect that the test for the grant of an injunction was that set out in section 37 of the SCA. That is just and convenient. The trust and CCG, supported by the official sister, 
argued that the test uh, was that found in section 16.5 of the MCA, it's necessary or expedient, and that's simply not right. That is also the position, that's the, the way in which it's advanced by uh, Mr. McKendrick. It'll take me a moment to find the turn up the page reference. And that's at page, uh, paragraph 30, uh, 37. Para 37. Para 37 of the revised skeleton on behalf of the father that I have, my lord, begins, the court was respectfully invited into error. Does your lordship have that? Well, I'm looking at one dated the 19th of July, Mr. McKendry. There, there is a replacement skeleton, my lord. Right. I should have that. I, I, I would have to send to my lord's clerk. You, I have, I thought that what I was reading was a replacement. Um, is that well, the very minor amendment? No, I just is it, is it significantly removed? No, no, references to the stay and permission to okay. remove. What paragraphs? Okay. So, my lord, if it assists in identifying <coughs> where the paragraph is in. Is this, is this point. Okay, well, I will. It comes at the end of the section dealing with section 37. Okay. And then I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Cameron. I, I knew I had a replacement and I thought it was the one in the bundle, but it obviously wasn't. You're reading the replacement. No, I mean the one in the bundle. Okay, so the Lord, Lord Justice Nugi has got them. Denier Cree. I can have that sent in, my Lord. That. No, no, we, we, I've definitely, I'm, You've I've seen it, I've seen it uh, but I've just hadn't made it. It's it's 22nd of August. Yeah. Yeah. Right, all right, yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, what was the paragraph? My Lord, in the version that I hope you have, it's paragraph 37. 37, thank you. Invited into error. Um, and I'm told, thank you very much, it's paragraph 42 in the July. 42. 42. Okay, well, rather than tra track down Mr. McKendrick's document, which I will do as soon as I realise, 42. Respectfully invited into error by being asked to apply the section 16.5, etc. Indeed. He doesn't actually say it was the trust case, but he says it was somebody's no, case. It's, well, and it's, your point is it wasn't anybody's case. Well, it's laden with ambiguity because, of course, Miss Powell's submissions could not have been clearer because she set out very clearly in the paragraphs of her closing that I, to which I took you um, that she was. Her analysis was that the court had the power under 37.1. What you showed us was the closing, was it? Yes. What did she. Did, 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 um, had it been different in opening? Uh, in her, I, her opening, which was at. The, it's a supplemental it's one. It's 11, isn't it? Page 11. That's the position statement. Yes. Uh, and then she deals with the law beginning at page 15. Mm -hmm. Sets out section mm -hmm. sections 15 and 17 of the MCA in paragraph 22. And she recites in case law giving and then S F, indeed. Okay. And that, that's the precursor for her closing submission, which is set out very clearly. And that's the basis upon which one has to analyse 
um, the way in which the Vice President approached the submission. Is there a do we need to worry about what the OS said at this point? Lord, I, I don't think so. This, at this okay, point. the OS was, no, nobody was, nobody was saying anything different. Nobody was saying anything different. argument. Okay, so then we go back to the judgment, is that what you want to do? Then we go back to the judgment, which is in the core bundle, page 108. Yeah. And it begins at 105. And then the relevant passages, as far as the analysis of the jurisdictional arguments, begin at page 108 in paragraph 7. And he recites the statutory provisions, 15, can I, before, 16, 17. Well, can I just pause you before you move on to the statutory provisions? Because it's okay. the introduction to that which gives the lie to the way matters had been put to him. Uh, Mr. McKendrick, acting on behalf of uh, the father, raises preliminary, preliminary points of law, challenging the jurisdictional basis for the injunctive relief. Uh, Ms. Cohn, on behalf of the mother, supports his submission. And then Mr. McKendrick also advances arguments relating to the admissibility. And then this, with respect to his seductive and erudite submissions, I can address the points that have been raised relatively briefly. Firstly, <laughs> it's contended uh, that section 16.5 of the MCA has been erroneously applied in the case law. I pause there. He did not say all the parties have agreed that it is uh, the, the power of the court is founded on sections 37.1 and 47. I disagree. Uh, and I'm going to now deal with the suggestion that... Okay. So, well, just moving along. Then he sets out... Mm -hmm. then, he sets out then we come to 8. Then we, in, and the 8 is... Really, the, 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 Mr. McKendrick's argument about deputies, mm -hmm. i.e., that Section 16.5 is all about deputies. Absolutely. And which was, the judge doesn't think much of. My Lord, his view, I think, replicated many of the uh, uh, arguments that have been put to Mr. Ken Mr. McKendrick this morning, um, both as to the syntax, and he deals with the way, okay. the, the straightforward wording of it. So that's. Right, so you're saying that is the context in which he said what he said at nine. No, nine. In the nine is, you say, do you, nine is, at, when he says it's the cogent framework, he means it, it's, it applies to all Section 16 2 of, or decisions, not just those relating to deputies. Indeed. And it's, and it's an ad, importantly, because nowhere has he said. Well, the parties have all agreed it's sections 37.1 and sections 47, but I disagree. There is a standalone um, section 16 power. Although that's how paragraph 9 reads, if you look at the submissions that were made to him, and that's critically important, what he was actually deciding was that section 16 and 17. Okay. So an entirely cogent framework for the granting of injunctive relief means. An entirely, you say, an entirely, yes. a, a comprehensive framework in, in, in which injunctive relief can be granted, but it doesn't go to the test. Indeed. What well, save, save in because so the test was never an issue. Because the test was never, was never an issue. And then you go on to the next argument of Mr. McKenzie in ten. And in paragraph ten, where he continued. Having reached that conclusion, I don't strictly have to deal with Mr. McKendrick's submission under 47.1 that there was no power to restrict behaviours in the context of either a hospital or a care home. Because he's decided that taken together, sections 37.1, 47.1, and 16, he did have power to grant the injunction. Right. So the, the point that Mr. Mc, he was dealing with there was a submission by Mr. McKendrick. You, whatever test you apply, you can't make orders restricting behaviours in the context of a hospital Indeed. or care home. Indeed. Because that's a matter between family members and the yeah. staff. And he was also grappling with Mr. McKendrick's um, submission, which uh, the Vice President dismissed, and with respect, it appears it may not have found much favour this morning. It's subsection 5. In subsection 5, applied only to deputies. Yes, well, that's he what I've just Gave that very short shrift. Okay. So, although it is infelicitously worded, read in conjunction with the arguments that were made by the parties, there is no, in my respectful submission, 
what he was concluding was not that there was a standalone house, and I will come to that in a moment, but that section 16.5 read with section 37.1 of the Supreme Court and section 47.1 of the Mental Capacity Act gave him all the power he required to make an order um, that was to give effect to his section 16.2. So, all right, so there were two, just to reiterate, there were two points which Mr. Kendrick was plugging, you, you say. One, that section 16.5 was confined to deputies, the yes. deputy provisions in section 16.2, which the judge dismissed in paragraph 8 and mm -hmm. made his comment in paragraph 9. Then, Mr. McKendrick's submission that whatever the, power, the, the injunctive powers under 47 uh, uh, were not apt to restrain behaviour in the context of a hospital or care home. And the judge dismissed that by reference to the wording of 3747 and to the Lord's observations in Polio. Yes. Right. Why does he say in paragraph 10, having come to this conclusion, that's the one in paragraph 9, I do not strictly have to deal with Mr. McKendrick's submission that section 47 is not apt to cover restricting behaviour. Because he had found that section 16.5 did grant that power. But isn't he there saying, uh, I can do it under section 16.5, I don't need to worry about section 47, which is precisely what he's accused of getting wrong. Lord, no, that's not, that's not what he said. That's not how I understood the, either the submissions to be made or him to have addressed them. And so that, in a nutshell, the f our first position in relation to the way the ar arguments were advanced is that because, probably because of the, the case having overrun, and because of his receipt of very detailed submissions on the law relatively late in the day, the way in which this is, exp is expressed is not as clear as it might otherwise. Well, just picking up my Lord's point, it, um, why, why did it follow, if you're right about your interpretation of paragraph 9 of his judgment. Why did it follow that he didn't have to deal with the point that he mentions in paragraph 10? Surely he did have to deal with it, didn't he? My Lord, no, because he was taking together all of the issues. He was taking the section 37.1, the section 47.1, and section 16.5 points together um, when he was deciding whether or not section 16.5 gave him the power uh, he required, or whether it was only linked to, uh, lim limited to deputies, and having decided already that he could grant that power, he, he could grant the injunction under six, section 16.5, he didn't need to deal with the 47.1 point. Now, you lost me now, Mr. Lyon, maybe because it's late in the day, but let's just, let's just see if we can unpick this. The Deals with Mr. McKendrick's second point. Yes. On the, on, on by reference only to section forty-seven and section, uh, and section thirty-seven, and the Lord's comments in Holyoke. Oh, yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't refer here to section sixteen at all. No, in this no. bit. No, and he deal, It's only in the context of I think those limited paragraphs there that it's addressed at all. challenge in respect of section 47.1 you'll see set out in paragraph 10 was limited to um, 
on the basis of the injunction being granted, on the basis that it was a matter between family members and staff employers, and the court, for some reason, lacked jurisdiction. Shall we look at... Look at Mr. McKendrick's closing submissions, so we can see what the judge was saying. Although, of course, Mr. McKendrick spoke to them, presumably as well. So that's at, um, in the supplementary bundle at page 33. Page 33. Say you were going to come back to this, Mr. Mullins, I did. I think, and the, he deals with injunctions in the Court of Protection at page 40. Paragraph 27. Paragraph, yes, beginning at page 20, paragraph 25. Paragraph 27 sets out the argument in relation to section 16. Section 32. He asserts there's no power to make an injunction. Yeah. Previous decision of the court which rely on section 65, part one, paragraph 33. Yeah. Paragraph 34, the court's past project come back to section 47 and thereby section 37. Just a convenient test, analyzed in 38. Holly, Holly Oaks, Lords. Case, paragraph 39. Mr. Justice Mostyn makes an appearance, paragraph 40. And then 42 is his overall submission. Indeed. Or assertion on the legal test. So where do we get to his ambitious argument, as the judge described it, on paragraph 10? Well, I'm assuming that was made orally. But your lordship asked me, and uh, my lord, Lord Justice Nugi asked me, if my interpretation is right, then why did he need to go on and make the comment in paragraph, uh, in paragraph 10 of the judgment? What you see in paragraph 34 of Mr. McKendrick's submission, closing submission, the way he put it, and by then, because he has now provided very detailed submissions, you can see that he also is saying the Court of Protection's Back on page um, 44, the Court of Protection's powers to grant an injunction come about by exercising section 47.1 and thereby section 37.1 of the 1981 Act. So he too, by now, it's a unanimous quorum that the power is not section 16.5 on a standalone basis, but sections 37.1. One and forty-seven one, and I accept the, the wording, the introduction to paragraph ten, is hard to square off. But it's very clear that all parties were saying before him, it's thirty-seven one and forty-seven one. That may have modified in the um, official solicitor's view now, um, because there is it's now suggested that there's a, a freestanding section sixteen five power independently of. Sections 37.1 and 47.1, I think. But so far as the judge was concerned, all the parties were saying the 16.5 power derives from sections 37.1 and 47.1. There was nobody saying anything different. And as I say again, if he had been reaching a conclusion that rejected the way that all counsel were urging him, he was granted the power to make the injunction. He would have said something in the judgment. Well, paragraph 9, read baldly, seems to be contrary to what you were all saying, doesn't it? It, it does, but, and that's why the context is important. And it would be, it w I would have no argument, and I'm some, somewhat hampered by not having um, argued the case below, 
but I've seen the submissions have been made very clearly by um, Miss Powell, and I understand that those were uh, submitted also orally uh, on the Monday. And the way in which the case was put by everybody was that Section 16 was um, attached to or, or ran from the powers Supreme Court Act as imported by Section 47.1. And that's why it, it reads on one reading without knowing that context. It's easy to understand why um, the appellants have drafted their grounds challenging uh, the decision in the way they have. But with a proper knowledge of the context, that we say just doesn't get off the ground because that argument was not put before the judge and it wasn't the argument he was dealing with. So the creative but ambitious submission which he refers to in paragraph 10 is not, is not the submission that section 16 is irrelevant, you, you're confined to section 47. It, it's a submission that since what we're dealing with is, is section 47 injunctions, you're limited to um, identifying some legal or equitable right, and this is a matter between the, the family members and the staff of the hospital and the, and the care home. And so it, it, it's not, not appropriate to deal with it in these proceedings. And what the judge is rejecting is he's saying, well, I can do it under section 16, brackets, not in contradistinction to section 47, yes. but, but drawing on the section 47 power. Yes. Because what I'm doing is giving effect to my previous order. Indeed, the section 16 too. So it doesn't matter no. the, the, the victim, as it were, of the harassment, as it were, is the employees. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not protecting the employees from harassment. I'm protecting my my order from being jeopardised or derailed. Protecting or giving effect to my order. Or giving effect that's to my order. Yeah. That's exactly right. And, and that's why he says he doesn't really need to deal strictly with that submission. He's not saying I need, don't need to deal with it because it, this is a Section 16 case, not a Section 47 case. He's saying because what I'm doing under Section 16 protecting the order that I've made. Oh dear. And in the way that my Lord Lord Justice Baker will be very familiar, um, orders are made not necessarily protecting placements as in this case, but restricting behaviour um, in P's best interest by judges all the time. And those will frequently involve restrictions on the behaviour of third parties and restrictions on the behaviours of third parties engaging, for instance, with hospital staff. So it would have, that's why one suspects the judge was rather startled for this submission to be made, and why one surmises he was he concluded that it was a creative but ambitious submission and one that couldn't be sustained. Can we just nail down for paragraph 14 and 15 of the judge's judgment? But after the citation from my Lord in Holyoke, the test for injunction is requires the court to be satisfied, says Mr. McKendry, said Mr. McKendry, that the injunction is just, convenient, and not necessary and expedient. How the unfettered nature of the Section 37 discretion should be exercised by the court is an underdeveloped. Is that a word missing? I think it might. Uh, probably the judge is under, underdeveloped. Is underdeveloped. Okay. It must, however, be a discretion exercised in accordance with legal principle that requires identification of the legal right that is sought to be protected. That is the point that the judge disagrees with in paragraph 30, paragraph 15. My lord, yes. And that's. If I can deal with that, that's my second point, um, B, which is that it's now contended that it's wrong in law to grant an injunction without identifying the legal or equitable rights um, between the parties. And that, I think most recently there have been a number of interjections from the bench, but my, my Lord Lord Nugie 
or just Nugi, raised that issue, which is that there's plainly a legitimate right here. She has a right um, by statute to be cared for, to have accommodation uh, supplied and paid for by the CCG if she's eligible. She has a right under the NHS Act for treatment if she is eligible. The court has made a best interest decision in her favour, saying that it's in her best interest to go to the care home. It cannot be suggested that she does not have a right which the court can protect by granting injunctive relief. Yes. The judge seems to call it an equitable right. Well, Lord On Lord Leggett's wording, it would be an interest which requires protection. Lord, yes. You at least accept that the way that the judge expressed um, his position vis a vis section 16 and section 47 1 was unclear. Um, it does appear on the face of it that he seems to be saying that section 16 is where you get the power from, and that he, if he refers to section 47, it were. My Lord, I'm, uh, I'd like to assist more, <coughs> but I'm, I'm looking at the judgment, um, which I've already accepted could have been drafted uh, more happily, and I wasn't there to hear or to give uh, any closing submission. But that appears to be uh, your Lordship's summary arrives at the same conclusion as mine. And what is your submission as to a true legal position now? I mean, I'm in the either enviable or unenviable position of not having drafted the skeleton. So um, I've, there are two horses that we can run. The first is the position set out in the skeleton, which is that um, the case as advanced was there had to be a legal, uh, there had to be a section 37.1, 47.1, and section 16.5 power. But having read into the case myself, and in particular having had the benefit of reading the written submissions on behalf of the official solicitor, the second horse that can be run is that the there is a freestanding power under section 65. Um, so you, you, you're, you're making two alternatives. Yes. Yeah. And it, although the section 165 um, argument is more novel, um, there I, I will leave Miss Roper to make more detailed submissions in respect of it. Um, th there is a lot to be said in its favour, and the, the one um, stumbling block might have been the difference between the tests applied by sections. 37.1 and 16.5. But the reality was, with some concern in preparing for this, one wonders whether the wording, the different wording of those two provisions, is in fact a distinction with no difference. Mm. Well, Mr. McKendrick's point, as I understood it, didn't turn so much on the wording, although he did place reliance on, on that, as Ms. Cohn did, but, but was that if you're acting under 16.5, you're looking with a single-minded view to the interests of the patient, whereas if you're granting an injunction, you should be balancing rights of both parties. And, and that's that was what he was putting forward, is the difference between whether you're acting under Section 47 or Section 16. My, my Lord, that's right. And, and it survives until one looks at the overriding objective, which I think was your Lordship's first interjection very early this morning. Um, and that brings us back to the fact that, in any case, um, the court has to decide matters justly. And although the starting point under Section 65 is an obligation to look at and consider best interest, the court still has to um, deal with matters justly, and that will require it to take into account the interests of others, whether they're convention uh, interests and rights or other rights. My Lord. Well, we're, 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 I think we'll break in a moment and revisit perhaps a all breather and perhaps come back to this first in the morning, but just, just so I'm clear on the interpretation of the judgment, your principal argument is the test was never an issue to, at all. The test was, everybody everybody agreed it was before the judge, it was section 37. No, that, just to convene it, that wasn't an issue. What was an issue is, what could the court of protection restrain by way of an injunction? 
And the judge answered that, Mr. McKendrick's points. First of all, by rejecting his submission that section 16.5 was confined to deputies, yes. and said on the contrary, section 16.5, 16, 5, 16 uh, contained a framework for granting whatever orders are necessary or expedient to, do, to, to order. And having reached that decision, he didn't need to deal with Mr. McKendrick's second point, which is you can't make injunctions regulating uh, behaviours in a hospital or care home. Mr. McKendrick's argument to that effect being based on the need for a legal right, and he said, the judge said, no, that's not right. Look at what the law has said in Holyoke. Um, it goes to equitable rights as well. Absolutely. And although, and, and you might, and, and if one reads it as, if one reads it on the basis that there's nothing about section 30, the section 37 test in it at all, it makes a judgment is entirely coherent, albeit perhaps it could be worded differently, particularly perhaps with the reference which we now have to Lord Leggett. Okay. Okay. Well, for my part, I'm, I'm clear on what you're saying about the what the judge was saying, but at the moment, I'm not entirely clear about what about what you say, how you say we should proceed. You want to ride both horses. I think we better revisit that in the morning. I'll deal with that then. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, uh, we'll resume at 10.30 tomorrow.